For sure. So James and I just reconnected after, I will help explain this a little bit on the introduction, but James and I met at the wellness experience put on by Joel and Kroger. And I want to, I want to mention this story to kick us off. I kind of said it to you when we talked, but I'll spell it out a little more. So I was at this event and there were a lot of people, a lot of passers by, a lot of vendors, a lot of things set up, stands, food, giveaways, et cetera. And there are also a fair amount of well-established people, you know, Jewel being probably the, the most established individual there, but you just see some competent looking people walking around. And I saw James, I didn't know who he was. I, I assumed kind of figured you were working there, but I just thought there's something about this guy. Like he's more than just a guy that's working here. He's something. Later come to find out his story, which you're all going to hear now. But it was like one of those things. I'm reading a book that I'll be covering on the podcast here soon called The Align Method. And he talks about posture and how you carry yourself and how you walk. And I just kind of tell by looking at you that you were, I don't know, something, someone had a story to you, had a skill set, had something. So it was cool to kind of find out who you are, where you come from and what what you do possess. So all that being said, welcome to the show, my friend. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's hilarious. Yeah, it was funny because I'd heard about you after you had interviewed uh, Cheryl on, on, on the podcast not too long ago, and then obviously saw you up on stage there. So it was cool just to see you up there doing your thing. And I think right away, minute we started chatting, we're like, yeah, we're meant yeah. to be Yeah, it was something there. Yeah, there was. There was something there. It was a cool bond. I think you and I share a lot of shared experiences and I think philosophies in life. But let's kind of start a little bit forward and then we'll backtrack. You mentioned Cheryl, the podcast, regular podcast listeners will have known her and or, you know, my relationship with uh, the Inspiring Children Foundation and Jules book, et cetera. But kind of establish who you are in relation to that before we dive into your story. Yeah. So um, in relation to Cheryl, um, so I work at the Inspiring Children Foundation here in Las Vegas. I've been here for about three years and um, I do a variety of different things at the foundation. But, you know, my previous life was was a was um, a tennis. I was a professional tennis player for about 10 years on the pro tour. And uh, when I when I near the end of my career after, you know, 10 years of of hardship and struggle and, 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 you know, traveling the world. Um, I was kind of lost in my life and what, how I got involved in, with the inspiring children foundation, uh, was my roommate in college back in 2006, I went to North Carolina state, but my roommate in college, um, you know, I, I had come from Ireland and, and he was from Las Vegas and I didn't even know people lived or were from Las Vegas. I thought it was just casinos. I didn't know there were actual like houses there that people lived in. And he told me about how he came from Las Vegas and he came through this youth foundation um, because he had been struggling as a young teenager with everything from, you know, being around the wrong people in a gang, selling guns, um, really kind of up to no good, was very angry with a lot of things in his life, like his parents were getting divorced and he was suffering a lot of financial hardship. And he spoke to me about how this one man, Ryan Wolfington, had kind of mentored him and took him under his wing and had, had taken an interest and invested in his own life. And so long story short, my roommate, his, his name is Freddie and Freddie Prendecki, and he, he ended up being the first person in his family to graduate high school and then going on to be the first person's family to graduate college and, and has gone on to have a very successful, happy life. And I was very inspired by that when I first heard it. And so at the end of my tennis career, um, and, and I know I'm missing a lot of pieces here, but at the end of a 10 year tennis career, when I was kind of lost and struggling and unsure what my purpose was in life and what was really going to fulfill me and drive me. I thought about those conversations that I had with Freddie and I thought about how interesting it is like to have someone like a mentor in your life or someone like Ryan Wolfington, who, who takes an interest and is willing to invest his time, energy and, and uh, you know, just commit to someone else uh, being better. So that's how I got involved in the foundation. I reached out to Ryan um, really just for a conversation on life. And uh, long story short, he ended up offering me a position to work here, and uh, not only as a tennis coach at our partner academy, uh, we have a partner with the No Quick Tennis Academy, but also I'm getting involved with other things involved with the daily work here, which involves mentoring, it involves fundraising, it involves marketing, a bunch of different things. Yeah, so how, how long was that conversation when you talked with your roommate, Freddie, until you actually looked Ryan up? Like, what was the last, was it like 10, 10 plus years? Yeah. Yeah. So when I first met Freddie, what had happened was um, a big box arrived to our dorm room one day and he 
Freddie picked it up, put it on his bedside table, opened up the box, and he, he took out a book. And the first book was the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. The second book was a book on philosophy. The third book was on psychology. And the fourth one was, I forget what the last one was, but it was a really interesting book. And at the bottom of the box, there was a note. And it was a very, like, it was handwritten. It was long. And I had asked Freddie, I said, was that your dad who sent you all these books? Like, you know, must be your family member. He's like, no, that was my mentor, Ryan. And so, and, and, the, and the note said like, hey, Freddie, you know, if you, you do the right things in your life and you, you're, you have a good attitude, you work hard do, you, and you do the right thing, everything is going to work out magically. Everything is going to work out better than you can ever imagine. And that was, that was the seed in my mind that planted, that was in my mind that kind of, I got thinking about this guy, Ryan. And, at this, and, and keep in mind, this was back in 2006. So the foundation was very small. It was, he was, it was really just helping a few people. But what had happened over the course of the next 15 years is Ryan helped another person, another person, another person. And all of a sudden an organization was formed. And, you know, that's when staff members came along and, and it's really an awesome ecosystem where we support one another, not only in our professional lives and helping them with school and with their tennis and that type of thing, but more importantly, with their emotions, helping them deal with trauma, helping them deal with their anger or their sadness or difficulties at home. I think, I think that's the real heart of what we do. That's the core of what we do. And obviously Jewel has been a massive part of that. Um, and that's why we, how we got involved with this wellness experience festival that we just talked about. Uh, we had flown, you know, 40 of our kids out there to help run the event. And we're big on, you know, project driven learning and, and having our kids get their, get their hands dirty, so to speak, and, and learn by doing real world projects. So it, it's really awesome. So that, that time frame was a good 10, 15 plus years from the time that those books arrived until you reached out to Ryan. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And just think like on a very kind of uh, obscure thought line here, like the internet and everything to, 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 to like if you don't want to do that, then it'd have been more difficult to get in touch to them 10 or 15 years later when there was social media, there was internet, there was more easily accessible information. And then the other thing I want to add about Ryan. So also I had him on the show and I don't have these numbers off the top of my head, but if you, you know, just scroll down, if you're listening, you'll find Ryan Wolfington a little bit further down, you'll find Cheryl O'Dell, but uh, Ryan's like an enigma. It's, it's almost one of those things where if I didn't actually see him and meet him and talk to him, I'd be like, this guy really exists. There's no, <laughs> like no one, the only things ever said about this guy are exactly what you're saying. Everyone that I've talked to, every, thing the the sense that i get when i'm around him his voice his like uh intent his whatever energy he gives off it is in line with the message that you are saying that cheryl says that all, everyone else who interacts with him says so it it really is cool and it's aspirational you know for me and probably for you to like to be like that right to be like that guy for um, sure and and i know for me I, I when i was really struggling in my life when i was i was about 30 years of age i was coming to the end of my career um, I was doing things in my life that I know I shouldn't have been doing. I was, you know, everything between going out and partying and, and do, just doing things that are not productive to my, my own life. And all, the, all at the same time, trying to be an athlete, like it's just, it's not going to work, you know? And, and so the reason I reached out to him, we had actually been friends on social media for a couple of years. And so he would post about the foundation and I would always like the posts and be, I, I always, it always spoke to me what the things he would, he would write about. And when I, the, the reason I reached out to him is because when I was struggling in my life, I, I, I asked myself the question, I've been asking myself for about a year or two is like, what do I want to be doing? How much money do I want to make? Where do I want to live? And I kept asking these type of questions and I realized it wasn't really taking me anywhere. And then eventually I was doing a yoga class one day in Atlanta. I'd been living in Atlanta for a few years. And I asked myself the question, I said, who do I want to be? If I had no money, if I had no home, if I had no car, if I had no anything, if no people around me, who do I want to be? What type of person do I want to be? And I realized, I said in that moment, I was like, well, I'm not happy with who I am right now. So I'm going to start thinking or thinking about people that I admire and I respect and I can look up to. And Ryan was the first person that came to mind. And so that's how that conversation happened. I reached out to him purely for a talk about life and kind of, you know, because I knew I needed to kind of be uh, someone, I needed a bit of guidance um, for someone to kind of point me in the right direction. And, you know, we ended up talking for two hours on a Saturday night in the middle of the summer of 2018. And, you know, it was just, it was, it was a really, I'm really happy I did that. I'm really happy I reached out to him and, and uh, 
the rest is history now. So that this could have been just a minor detail or it could have been significant, but I want to ask anyway, the, when you, you said you were asking where you want to live, how much money you wanted to make, et cetera. And then the, the last question you said was, who do I want to be? Was that a shift? Was that an intentional shift? Or was that just the wording that you used when you talked to me? Like, did something switch where it was like, boom, and okay, that sent your brain in a different direction? I tell you what, it came to me because when I was when I was doing this yoga class, I happened to have a great teacher in Atlanta. His name is Graham. And it was one of those. I don't know if you've ever had those yoga classes where you just really get into it. Like either it's the music that's good or you're, you're just in your flow. I was totally present in the class. And near the end of the class, when we were um, when we were kind of doing Shavasana or, or whatever, I think that's the name of it, Shavasana, um, I, I, the, the, it just came to me. It was an intuitive moment. I, I didn't force it. I didn't will it. It just kind of came to me and it said, who do you want to be? Like, who do you want to become? And it was very, it was very quiet. It was very clear. And then I knew in that moment, I was like, okay, like I'm going to change my life. I'm going to move in a different, different direction. So I didn't will it. I had been willing all the other questions. Mm -hmm. I've been forcing it. I've been thinking, I've been going into my head for answers and I really had to go into my heart. It kind of came naturally um, to me. I th so I come from a, a really blue collar background and grew up in central Pennsylvania and never really thought about, certainly about yoga, you know, that was weird and spirituality was weird and, you know, a deeper meaning was like, I didn't even think about it. I was just like wrestling and that was it. And then the older I get kids and age and death, you just, I anyway, start to think of things differently. Um, and I, I think that's a good, like maybe uh, PSA to someone who's, who's thinking like, what are they kind of talking about? I want to understand. But the thought for me, the uh, work on myself, I worked, did a lot of work on myself. I would hear that and think, what in the hell are they talking about? What do they mean work on myself? But I think what you just said there spells out a line that I, I think about often to change yourself. One, it has to be intentional. Right. You have to like aware, like focused and intentional. Hey, I want to I want to get I want to for me personally, like speaking real time, I want to be more patient with my kids. I just want more patience. So then like, well, how do you actually work on that? Well, you read books about it. You listen to people who talk about it and then you kind of match that intention with those resources, with your actions. And it all comes together in one. So he's saying he didn't force it. It just came to him. It came to him because it was a focus and he was doing the yoga and then boom, it came. So it's like, it didn't just come out of nowhere. It was almost like you were priming yourself for a, a message or a voice or a something to come to you. And it sounds kind of deep and you can say it's foo-foo, but there have been times where things have happened to me, especially fighting related, where I'm like, where the hell did that come from? Like, how did that happen? Or why did I think that? Well, I don't know. I just, I was kind of aligning everything so that maybe that thing would happen. For sure. Um, so let's get to your story. That was a good background. And, and again, a good, um, not even plug, plug sounds cheap, but for what you do, what Ryan does, Cheryl does, what Jewel does with the Inspiring Children Foundation, because that at the wellness experience, and I've talked about this in you know, posts throughout the whole uh, experience for me, it, it was like there was an army of young people who were freaking in control, like 20 to 24 year olds who were walking around like they owned the place, meaning they, they, they were like doing the work and they were confident and they were polite and they were communicating well. And they were like uh, competent in that they were doing what they were supposed to do. And it wasn't easy. There was like a thousand pieces. And I was like, oh my gosh, they're all like the kids. I say kids, but young adults from this program. And even some of the performers were, and it, 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 it's almost like an army. I'll say an army of good people. Like that's simply what it seemed like. It's so cool to see real tangible examples of that yeah and 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 you know we do a ton of different events and sometimes we we call ourselves seal team six yeah because we come in and we kind of get the job done we do so many different events and obviously being in las vegas helps because you know you're in the entertainment capital of the world so we're we see a ton of events and and obviously last year with covid all of our fundraising um, events because we're primarily event driven and um, they had to shut down so we ended up losing 80 percent of our funding in, in 2020 but in the years prior to that we've just done so many different events and so our kids kind of know what they're doing and and so much of it is you know this is part of what the you know what the foundation teaches uh, in terms of project driven learning and we have an, an entrepreneurship program as well and so much of it is about learning how to grind. So much of it is about the mindset. We have different principles within the foundation. We, we, we talk about CEO mindset, you know, like 
being an owner, taking ownership of, of whatever project that you're doing. Uh, we have another principle, grind before you shine. Like this idea, like, you, you know, you're not going to get into the limelight right away. You, it's all about do, doing the small things, you know, we, doing the small things well. We talk about small time is big time. And, and just get being good at doing the doing the little things because that's what really matters. So it's cool to hear from your perspective what you saw um, and how our how our how our kids or young adults were, were going about their business because that's that's what that's what spoke to me as well when I first met um, the kids, which was in in um, in the summer of 2018. I saw them at an event in New York and they were just running the show and they had a smile on their face and they were excited and they were confident. And it was like, like you had mentioned, like it's, it's, it's kind of like a different energy. You just sense it about them. So great yeah. to hear that from you. Yeah. And I want to throw in two funny asides just with American culture slash my personal experience to tie to something you talked about. Um, and then we'll get to the, you know, grind before you shine, because that's a good segue into your career. But um, it's so I again, I grew up in central PA. What you said about Vegas, I didn't know people lived in Vegas either until, I don't know, uh, I'll say I was 20, maybe, I don't know, somewhere around that. So it wasn't just because maybe you were from Ireland and you didn't, uh, I hardly knew that. And then another thing with me, it's like we take things for granted. I forget that the U.S. is huge. I think all of Europe is the size of um, uh, Texas. Like, I think that, that geographically that that's accurate. So you forget how much stuff here is in the U.S., but New York City is another thing. Whenever uh, people outside of the U.S. think of the U.S., they think of New York City. I had never been to New York City, I think, until I was 23 or 4. So it's just like a big misconception in, in the vastness between West Coast and East Coast. Like, it's, it's huge. So it's, it, it's fun. For, I enjoy thinking about these cultural shifts that, you know, no matter where you're from, I don't know. They're, they're just little nuances of life that, that I appreciate touching on. That's awesome. <laughs> So let's get into the, the uh, tennis and that grind before you, you shine it, it sums this up. I know that's not your intent when you said that it was with the foundation, but that that's kind of it. And it reminds me of, I think it was Michael Phelps, who it's the, the quote from the, the commercial thing on Under Armour. It's what you do in the dark that puts you in the light. Mm -hmm. And I really connected with you well, because in the brief time that we talked about your professional tennis career, my fighting career, there was a lot of synchronicity and similarities. And people have the misconception, oh, you're a pro fighter, that I live in a mansion, I have a shit ton of money and life is awesome, right? It's not that way for 99.9% .9 of people. For sure. And I had watched a documentary that I can't remember, but it followed a tennis player and it showed the grind of his professional tennis career. And a lot of what you and I talked about shared that. So Maybe start with your origins, right? Your upbringing, where you, where you were in Ireland, how you came up, how you got into tennis, and then how you eventually ended up at NC State. Yeah. So, um, so I'm from Dublin, Ireland. Um, grew, up, uh, grew up there in a, in, a, in a suburb called Castleknock. And I played a bunch of different sports growing up. You know, in Ireland, we have Gaelic football and hurling, and I was big into those sports growing up. And What is Gaelic football? It's a national sport in Ireland. It's a, it's kind of like a combination between soccer and rugby, and uh, I don't want to say American football, but is it different me? than Australian football? Uh, it's it's it is different. They use a different ball. I'm not sure if they have the same amount of players on the team, but it it ha if anyone watch Aussie Rules, you'll see how rough and tough it is. Like it's it's a pretty rough sport, and same with Gaelic football. So you can hold the ball; it's the size pretty much of a soccer ball, but you can pass it with your hands and with your feet, and you can score a point over the bar or three points if you score in the goal. And it's a national sport, and it's huge. It's huge in the country. So I I grew up playing that, um, along with another sport called Irish hurling. Um, which is really worth going on YouTube to look it up because it's the fastest field sport in the world. Um, it, 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 it's incredible. Irish, um, what is it? Hurling? Hurling, H-U-R-L-I-N-G. And, and do you call soccer football or soccer? Uh, fo well, football. But, but, but in America, when I'm talking about soccer, I call it soccer. So you have football. You have Gaelic football, which is yeah. actually kind of like American football. And then you have yeah, kind of like Aussie rule, uh, okay. kind of like Australian football, yeah. But football with like F O O T ball, and then you have soccer, which you call football as well. 
Correct. No, it gets kind of confusing. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let's progress forward. <laughs> so I played a bunch of sports, um, lived less than a mile away from a tennis club there. And tennis really spoke to me. My mom played tennis. And before you know it, by the time I was, you know, 10 years of age, nine or 10, I knew that this is what I wanted to keep pursuing. Um, I played a bunch of other sports till about 13. And then when I was 13, I, I pursued tennis full time. And I, I knew by 12 or 13 that I wanted to be a professional. I wanted to be a professional tennis player. But what was funny is coming from Ireland, coming from a country that not only is a small island, but we, we, do, we hadn't had a lot of top professional tennis players. There weren't a lot of top role models or pros that I could look up to. Now, we did have great, good tennis players. But we didn't have any that were, you know, playing in the U.S. Open or playing in Wimbledon or playing in the, at the biggest stage, you know. And so I had this dream of being a trailblazer and kind of being the first guy to achieve that. One of the one of the first Irish tennis players to kind of play at the highest level. And it wasn't just for, for Ireland, but it was also for myself. Like I loved, I loved the game. I loved to play. And when I was about 13 years of age, I met a Canadian tennis coach. His name is Larry Jurovich. He came into my life and he started talking to me about the value of hard work and believing in myself and having discipline. And he used to give me books. I remember he gave me a book on the, um, the sprinter, Michael Johnson. And I think it was called Slaying the Dragon. And he talked about, the discipline it took him to shave off two seconds from his 200 meter time and his 100 meter time and and how that took him 10 years to take off two seconds from his time and that book really spoke to me and I'm glad my coach kind of shared those stories with me because it really I and those books with me because I felt like it shaped my character I felt like it shaped me as a young man especially when you're 13 or 14 you're very impressionable at that age and so um, when I was about 17, I was, you know, I, I, I gradually worked my way up to being number one in the country as a, as a tennis player. But being one, number one in Ireland is not, you know, you're a big fish in a small pond. It's not a big deal. It's great to be number is this one but, professionally. Oh, this is like as a junior tennis player. I, I was the number one kind of junior tennis player. And probably as a senior, I was probably top three, I would say at the time. I was, I was kind of pushing the guys who were already pros or who were already uh, top in, in the country. Um, I moved, ended up moving to Barcelona, Spain. I left um, what, what in America you would say 11th grade. I left Ireland in 11th grade. And I ended up moving to Spain because the best tennis players in the world were training out of Barcelona. And you had the likes of Andy Murray, who, you know, went on to win two Wimbledons and a U.S. Open. And you had all these top players who were who were training out of Barcelona. But when I moved there. What, and, sorry to interject. What year do you think this was? This was 2005. I'm trying to think when I was over there, too. And it, it wouldn't I feel like it wouldn't have been too far off that we might have been there at the same time. That's a pretty <laughs> cool thought. to, to, to back me. Yeah. Yeah, I was there 2005 and 2006, right before I went to went to college. So ended up when I went to Spain, um, didn't do a great job with my recovery, didn't do a great job with my training and was over in one of these academies where, you know, you're you're not really taken care of. You, you don't have a coach or someone taking you under their wing. And that's where I really struggled. I overtrained. Long story short, ended up getting injured for a year and a half where I couldn't lift a tennis racket because I broke a bone in my hand. It was a stress fracture that kept recurring. So my sponsors, I had a couple of sponsors who had, who had supported me in going to Spain. They knocked them or they gave me a call one day and they said, listen, you're going to have to go to college in America to, to get not only your education, obviously, but get your, get your tennis back on track because you haven't played tennis in a year and a half. So none of the top colleges in America were willing to give me a full scholarship because I hadn't played tennis in a year and a half. So I ended up going to North Carolina State because I had a friend, his name's Connor Taylor, who went to NC State before me and he put in a good word with the coach and the coach took a, took a, um, a risk and um, he gave me a full scholarship, which I'm very grateful for. So I ended up doing two years at North Carolina State, met, met a bunch of people there, thankfully fixed my hand injury, thankfully got back on track with my tennis where I could play to a high level again. And in the summer of 2008, um, I got a call again from the sponsors who had supported me in the past. And they said, James, we'd love to support you to go back on the pro tour um, if that's what you're willing to do. But you're going to have to leave college and, and, uh, and, and do it. And at the time, I'd been struggling with a number of different things. And it was kind of like a lifeline in my life. And I really, really wanted to be a professional tennis player. It meant the world to me from kind of day one. And I took that risk and I ended up, I ended up technically becoming a professional tennis player at 21 years of age. 
and starting my life um, on the pro tour, which 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 involved going down to Venezuela to start to start um, because my first professional tennis terms were in Venezuela, which as many people know, it's it's a re- it's a pretty dangerous place. So that's how, that's how I started my pro career. And over the course of the next 10 years, talking about this concept of grind before you shine, um, as professional tennis players, you kind of start at the lowest level, which is maybe in, in baseball terms, it's like the minor leagues. And you work, you work your way up through different, um, you know, you have the futures tour, then you have the challenger tour, and then you have the ACB tour, which is kind of what you see on TV. And the first, I would say, three years of my pro career, I was on the futures tour and that, you know, I would go to places like Venezuela. I was in Syria. I was in Kazakhstan. I was going to China and all around Asia and parts of Africa um, to get ATP points or get ranking points to get me into the highest level. And, you know, it's it's, it's interesting, this whole journey. And I'll let you um, yeah. because I'm sure you have questions right now. But the whole experience was extremely stressful and uh, it was very financially difficult. But yeah, I'll let you. I'll let yeah, you. Th- there's a couple of things. I want to bookmark the Venezuela because I want to go back to that. But I do want to ask some like here and now questions as comfortable as you are. Or if you can give us an idea, how many people were at these tournaments and how much money was being paid to the people who won these tournaments? <laughs> uh, honestly, there were very there were many, many times that um, there were no people at my matches. There was like a, literally zero. Literally zero people. There was a lot of matches that I played, particularly in the qualifying events. There was me and my opponent and one umpire on the court. And if you're lucky, you had a ball boy, someone that would you know pick the balls up, some local you know, 14, 15 year old that's doing it because he just loves the game. Um, so there's no people. You're, I remember when I went to Syria, um, my first couple of matches, uh, or not Syria, um, I think it was Kazakhstan, my first couple of matches. I mean, I had no one there watching me and that's okay. You're willing, you're willing to do it because you know that this is, this is what it takes to, be, to, to, to eventually get to the highest level. But I had many situations, even, even at that level. I mean, there are t- sometimes situations where you have people there, but you know, the crowds against you, you're playing some local wild card that wants to beat you. Um, it's extremely, you know, doggy dog. And, and, and to an- answer your question about the money, you know, I was probably paying, um, if, if I won my first round of a futures tournament, you're probably getting maybe t- less than 200 bucks after tax, maybe, maybe 300. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I think less than 200. Yeah. So, you, and, you know, you're. And who, who's paying for you to get there? Uh, that's, that's, that's me. That, like, that's my, that's my own money. And, and, and what was interesting is, the, my sponsors who, who supported me in 2008, as we know, 2008 was the time of the recession. They, they, they said they'd support me for a number of years, but within a few months, they, I got the call up saying that they had no money anymore. So I was in a, in a position where I'm, I'm trying to travel the world and play these tournaments, but I have no money to get there. So I'm staying in hostels. I'm sleeping on friends' couches. I'm, I'm obviously flying low budget airlines like Ryanair and EasyJet. And I'm trying to get to these tournaments on, you know, just on uh, scraping my way through. So it was really rough for about three or four years. Um, and I didn't make any money. I was in debt. I was, I was about 6,000 uh, euros in debt in, in about in 2009. And I started writing about my experience. I created a, a blog, um, jamesmcgeetennis.com. And the, whole, the, the name of the blog was Life as an Irish Professional, professional Tennis Player. And this was in 2011 or 12 that I started it. And I just started writing about my experiences, just being honest, like, hey, like I spent, you know, 1500, I spent 1500 to $2,000 to get to this tournament and I made 200 bucks. That's what I was going to ask. So that wasn't a net 200. That was a gross 200 net negative 1300. Correct. Yes. For the freaking love of it. That's why I was so excited to have this conversation. I'm smiling because I've, I've been there, buddy. Uh, but a lot of people just don't, they don't, they're just not exposed to it. So they don't ever think of it. And then when they hear it, it's like, what? Like, I'm sure many of you listen, whenever he spelled out and said 200 and zero people in the stands, it's like, why the hell would you do it, dude? But I know why you did it. It's the same reason I did it. Like, it's the same reason that if you want something, you do it because you want it. 100%. And the, to backtrack a little bit to, Venezuela. I remember. So where I'm from, there's a a uh, former professional jet skier, one of the best ever, world champ, 
I think multiple time world champ. But I remember one time in between fights, I was home. Uh, this actually made me think of another thing I want to touch on. The the kind of uh, hierarchy or chronology that you said, the different tours, the futures tour, the this, that, that, the way it works in fighting is local, regional, and then eventually national slash international. So local would be literally in my town right here next door. Regional would be like Atlantic City or maybe uh, Native American Casino, something like that, maybe out west. And then national, international is like the UFC, Bellator, one, et cetera. So that's the hierarchy. And you take these like, you know, shit paydays to just for the chance to make it. And, you know, it, it you just do it. You do it because you want to do it. But back to the, the uh, in between one of these local fights, I, you know, Eric was, you know, a mentor friend to me early in my career. And he said to me, like, just he said, flat out, enjoy this right now right? Enjoy this right now. This was before I progressed to the UFC or anything. This, this is what you'll remember. That's what he said to me. This, just enjoy it right now. A lot of it sucked at that time, but I was able to take a step back and be appreciative of this part of the journey. And that's what I love to talk to people so much about now. So take me to Venezuela, right? Take me to Syria, take me to Kazakhstan. Like, what do you remember from there? Was it sound, smells, people, uh, loneliness? Like what were some of those feelings and or tangible things you remember? So my first tournament was in a place uh, called Marac Maracaibo in Venezuela. Maracaibo, I think, my, I think one of my friends is from Maracaibo. No way. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. And um, I had been warned prior to going to Venezuela that it, it's a pretty dangerous country. And I'd been warned that when I actually got to Maracaibo, I stayed at a more expensive hotel because people said there were kidnappings at the other hotel. So I was like, I was kind of freaked out when I got there. Um, you know, it was extremely hot. Um, coming from Ireland, I'm not really used to those, those temperatures. You're, you're looking at, you know, over a, a hundred and in Fahrenheit, it's probably 105, 110, something like that, which is fine here in Vegas because we're getting it all the time right now. But I just remember going to these tournaments and you know i have to say my experience in venezuela with the people was 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 really nice the, the, we had we had great uh, crowds there the locals were, were really kind and nice um but i got food poisoning the first week that i got there i i ended up bringing like some some bars with me some protein bars and um i'm not sure if it was from one of the bars or just from some bad chicken or something that i ate at one of the hotels um, but I ended up getting sick there for a couple of weeks, um, <clears throat> which kind of ruined my whole experience. So it was kind of like a warm welcoming to professional tennis because it's absolutely not what you expect. You know, it's you're on your own. You're trying to figure out guys to practice with. You have to get your racket strung. You're doing your laundry, you know, to save money. I was doing my laundry in the bathtub. That was something that I did all the time every week. And me, I, I actually sweat a lot. I sweat more than most players. So if I'm in humidity, I might go through five or six shirts in a match and I have two pairs of shorts. And I would be just washing them in the bathtub every night after my matches. And that's a, yeah, that's something that I remember because the hotel prices for laundry were just too expensive for me. So things like that were, were, were very common. And the way that it works, like talking about the, 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 the Futures Tour and the Challenger Tour, you know, sometimes you have to play these low level events to get matches and to get your points to, to increase your ranking so you can get into other tournaments. And that's why I went to the, some of these countries. And, you know, when I, I remember when I went to Syria, um, I had been playing a Davis Cup match for Ireland in Cyprus the day before. And in that match, I was playing against a, a guy named Marcus Bagdadis, who made the final of the Australian Open. And it, it, the first point of the match, I ended up twisting my ankle, ended up having like a grade two sprain. I could barely walk. Um, and that night, the, the night of the match, I flew out to Syria to play a tournament the next day. And so I arrive in Syria in, in Damascus. I've got a bro like I basically have a broken ankle. I'm hobbling around the airport and my bags didn't arrive. And I had a tennis match the next day in Damascus. So you can imagine the stress levels. Like I've taken two flights. I can't walk. I don't have my bags. I've no money. And I've got a tennis match the next day. It sounds like I, a nightmare, man. It was, it was a nightmare. And I don't even know how to get to the, to the, um, and by the way, no one speaks English and I don't know how to get to the hotel. <laughs> but like, uh, you're, 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 you know, there's many moments where you kind of just stop and like look up to the sky and you're like, what the hell am I doing? You know, why am I out here? And what was funny is I ended up making, to, making it to the hotel, slept about four hours because uh, I, I had an early morning match the next day. 
found up, found some local guy to warm, warm me up just to get my strokes loose. But I didn't even use my own tennis racket. I had to use the tennis racket of this Australian guy that was there. He gave me his shoes. He gave me a racket and he gave me, um, he gave me his shirt, which was like the kindest thing of all time because I'm competing against these, these guys. And he was kind enough to, to give me his equipment. So I ended up playing some local wild card. In that particular match, all the locals had come out because he had waited all year for the match. And so I step out on court and there's one guy in the corner playing the drum in the corner. They've got other people saying, you know, yalla, 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 like screaming that in my face every time I make a mistake. And there were so many moments. Like This is one small example of what it was like going week to week on the pro tour. And that was that was one moment that stands out to me. I ended up coming through and winning that match. But it took every ounce of willpower that I had. And, and you know, they're the stories that you remember at the end of the day. Like, it, it, it is blood, sweat, and tears. Um, but I'm glad I did it because it toughens you up and it, it gives you perspective on, on what's important. It does, and that's exactly what Eric was talking to me about. You know, in, you and I having this conversation, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years after you had that, 15, 10 years after you had that experience. Like, that, 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 those are the things you remember. I'm sure you had some big wins, but everyone celebrated the big wins and you know the big wins, but not many people know those days where it, uh, the, the washing your clothes in the bathtub to me is like, poof, like that's a, that's a, that's tough, man. And yeah. it, it's such a good, clear example of you want it. Like there's a uh, Dana White on one of the, the ultimate fighter shows that he has a famous line that says like, so you want to be an effing fighter because of one of the things that one of the guys going through, I forget, but I mean, that's the truth of it. So any sane person would be like, why the hell are you doing that, James? Like what, that's crazy. But to you, it's like, well, what do you mean? Like I'm, I'm doing yeah. it. Like, you're do it's so clear to you why you're doing it. For sure. Uh, talk about your kind of progression. You, you, your, your, you know, I don't really know. Like I said, when I, when I, you thought before I saw this documentary a couple of years ago, professional tennis, I just thought like, Oh yeah. Like Roddick and Roddick's first guy, I think, yeah. um, um, you know, all, all these guys that, all, that, that I watch on TV, boom. Talk about your progression, your exposure, some of the cool experiences you had in professional tennis. I can think of like some of the memorable, oh, I met this guy who was a hero of mine. And this guy was, I, I remember being in the same room. So talk about some of the, the progression in the cool moments, the moments, the happy, some of the happy memories that could have been wins or not, but cool experiences that you had. Yeah. So, so a lot of things started to change around 2011, 2012 for me. Um, when I, I, I started winning some more matches and I was fortunate to get some sponsorship from my local tennis club. That's, there's a long story behind that, but it made a huge difference in my life because I could start playing more tournaments and traveling to the odd tournament with a coach as well. And when you have a coach, as you know, when you have someone in your corner, it makes such a difference. You know, it, it sounds crazy to think you wouldn't have a coach. Yeah, no, I never had a coach for those, the, the, those first years. I couldn't because you have to pay them and I didn't have the money to pay. So. <laughs> That's insane. Yeah, no, you're doing it literally on your own and you're carrying, you know, three or four bags everywhere you go because you've got your rackets and you're, you're living out of your suitcase. I was traveling 45 weeks a year. And so it's, it's, it, you're a full blown gypsy. So, and uh, real quick, you, you mentioned this earlier, but I don't want to just gloss over in case someone missed it. You're funding all of this travel. Is that correct? Correct. But when in 2011, when my local tennis club came in that they, they started supporting me, which was a massive help. And that was, that honestly was kind of like just luck of the draw. That was kind of, you know, that was kind of like, thank God that they were there, that they were there to support because it definitely made a difference because all of a sudden I was able to play these tournaments and my ranking improved. Um, by the middle of 2013, I got into Wimbledon. So I got into the qualifying of Wimbledon, which as anyone knows who follows tennis, it's the, you know, the biggest tennis tournament in the world. And just to be in the qualifying is, is an achievement in itself. And I think you have to be about, I was ranked 230 in the world at the time. You have to be in the top 230 in the world just to get into this tournament. So I got into the tournament and once you get into these high level tournaments, you start getting more media exposure, you start being around the best players, you start practicing around the best players. And over the course of the next few years, I started being around top, top tennis players. So I practiced with Rafael Nadal when I was in um, Barcelona, because um, I used to be in and out of Barcelona at the, at the time. I was friends with his coach. We used to get out, out on court a couple of times. Um, I started practicing with Andy Murray. Um, I qualified into the U S open in 2014 
And that was my first Grand Slam that I that I qualified into. And, and once I qualified into the Grand Slam, things kind of started to explode. Like I, I, I got more sponsorship offers. I got into bigger tournaments. And the following year in 2015, I played my first uh, ATB 500 event, you know, which is basically the biggest, you know, the best tennis players in the world are playing them. And from 2000, let's just say 2013 up until the end of 2017, I was pretty much in, in, I was knocking on the door of the highest level of professional tennis. You know, I was playing Grand Slams, I was playing Masters Series, I was playing Challengers or high level Challenger events and ATP events. And I never, let's just say I never like progressed to the highest level where I was winning matches consistently at the ATP level. But I, I, I kind of was, I was kind of knocking at the door and I, throughout that experience, I mean, even talking about it now, to be honest, Charlie, it's, it, it's so, there was so much that went into it and there was so much emotion and energy and, and, and effort that it, it, I even feel a little stressed talking about it because it's like, I can't tell you how hard it, I, I, know. I, it, I worked like, and I know, you know, yeah, I, I don't know where to start. And I, I talked to my friends about this recently. I was like, I think sport has trauma associated with it. Like, I think there's like some sort of a, like, like PTSD from, from, from traveling and competing and, and putting your heart on the line and losing matches and kind of like being reminded of it. I mean, I had something recently where I would go into airports and I would all of a sudden feel really anxious. And someone asked me like, cause they weren't anxious and they're like, why are you anxious? I'm like, I don't know. I think I associate airports with like the day after a loss because yeah. I would always go into an airport the day after a loss. And, and uh, you know, there, there really is so much to this story. It's hard, it's hard to summarize it. So just a, 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 a super good example of that. Yesterday it happened to me, my daughter had her first day of field hockey practice and we, we were taking her and we were just walking along in the song, teenage wasteland, the uh, like the music, I think it's called teenage wasteland, but they play that at the UFC. They used to anyway, when I was there, like, as the event was starting, there's just like montage and it's freaking awesome, but it also made me sick to the stomach. So every time I hear that song, I get chills and I get sick to my stomach because it's like, mm. and, and we were talking about airports and arriving to airports and the, the, the nerve nervous that's all hell about, oh, especially when you have to fight because it like hurts and it sucks and super scary, but all, all of those nerves um bottled up and and i you know it, it is i think about this often too because athletes are now they're becoming more and more open about you know simone biles being the the, the most uh, recent example of just the the mental stress and and anxiety that goes with performing but to me it's, it's almost like we're spelling out what is like, i do think it is that way i think it's always been that way and i also think that that's like not a cost of doing business, but it, I mean, it is inherent. Like if you play football, you're going to get hit. If you fight, you're going to get hit. It, like to be the best, you got to subject your things, subject yourself to things that people don't. And there is a cost to that. So how you handle that cost and how you handle that subjection can, can, you know, make you healthier or not healthier mentally and emotionally, but it's, we're pointing out a thing that is right. If, if, if you want to get there, you've got to do these things. Yes. That's inherent in the thing. It, absolutely. And, and everything comes with a price, you know, and, and you kind of learn that the hard way on the pro tour. There, there's so much sacrifice. There's so much pain that's involved, but for some reason or another, like, like what you said in your journey and, and, and my journey as well, you just want it. And it's something you love. Like there was something I, I loved about competing. There's something I loved about getting out there and pushing myself to the limit. There, there is a high with it. And it's almost it's almost like you're an addict in a way. You kind of just need that next high. And I know a lot of athletes speak towards that, towards the adrenaline rush um, and missing that post-career. You know, like, how do you get that adrenaline rush? It's, you, it's very hard to get it in day-to-day -day life. Um, and so I feel like we put ourselves through that pain because the, the adrenaline rush is so high and it's such a, it's a thrill whenever you do overcome those, those challenges, you know? So that's my experience with it. Yeah. And one of the reasons, again, that I'm drawn to you is because I, I think we have pretty similar careers in different sports. You know, I think we're, we're pretty similar, like our, our 
uh, total career summary is like you're knocking on the door, you're there, you're not there, you're winning, you're losing. One of the things that I appreciate so much in I, if, if you would tell anyone, right? So I'd say to my, my I don't know, whomever, hey, I met, uh, I met a, we'll say tennis, I met a professional tennis player today, or I met a football of NFL player today. Unless you say like uh, uh, Joe, Ak- no, no, uh, you, uh, Djokovic. Djokovic. Yeah, Djokovic. Unless you say him, they're like, oh, who's that? Right. Unless you say like Peyton Manning or Tom Brady, they're like, oh, who's that? People forget there's like a whole world, like a, like 99.99999% are not Tom Brady and are not Peyton Manning and are not Federer and are not these people. So whenever mm-hmm. I have the opportunity to talk to someone like you to basically megaphone to the world, mm-hmm. this is the reality of, of it right? This is the reality that the reality is a guy who's 230 or 190 or 98 or 800th or whatever fighting and clawing for it. So to get to that upper, not even just the up, I was explaining this to a kid the other day, I did an assembly and we were talking about UFC champs and he was like, oh, so when you're the champ, then you can call the shots. And I was like, no, because when you're the champ, there's like, there's the uh, Connor, like there's the champ champ right? And then there's like the guys who repeat four times, they call the shots. Like when you're the UFC champ, you're like the freshman in high school. When you're not a UFC champ, you're like the elementary student. So even when you get to be the champ, there's levels to champ. And when you're like, it's so interesting. I didn't even, I wasn't even aware of that. So when you're the champ champ, right? Connor writes his own, you, you know, probably weaning off a little bit, but boom, he's it. And then below them that that you might have could have said Jones in the past, but like, I mean, you lose power quick and it, it, it just shows like how upper that upper echelon is. And then how many of you and me there are in professional sports. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. Thanks for explaining that. I didn't even, I didn't even know that. Yeah. And and professional tennis. I mean, we have, you know, I think there's 2000 ranked tennis players. You know, and, and, you know, as you said, people would know Rafael Nadal, Roger Federer, and Novak Djokovic, and probably anyone else, they're probably not sure. Yeah, like kids, I guess, like, I say kids, but not even kids. Like, if you said Roddick, people would be like, I don't really remember him. Who's, yeah. Huh? It's like he was, like, the best 10 yeah. years ago or something like that. I know. <laughs> I, I, I said to our kids recently, do you know who Pete Sampras is? And for anyone that knows Pete Sampras won 14 grand slams. I mean, he was the greatest tennis player of all time before Roger Federer. And they're like, no, don't know who he is. And I was just like, wow. So that's amazing. <laughs> when I talk to the, you know, I speak in schools a lot. When I talk to kids, they're like, uh, who have you met? And I'm like, the people I met when I met them were the equivalent of Connor, but you're not going to know them because this was 10 <laughs> years ago. And it just, it churns so fast and it churns so fast. That's yes. it's 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 insane. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, finances in terms of you can break it down like whatever the ranking starts. You know, wherever the ranking starts, like give someone an accurate view of money that's made in professional tennis from whatever ranking three hundred down to number one. Yeah, it's hard to give you an exact number, but let's typically they say that in tennis. When you're top 100 in the world, that's when you've quote unquote made it. Or, you, you know, you say he's top 100, he made it. In other words, he's playing in the Grand Slams. Obviously, the U.S. Open is on right now. Um, Wimbledon, French Open, the Australian Open. When you're in these tournaments, just to be in the tournament in the first round, I've, I don't know the exact number, but it's around fifty or $60,000 just to be in the tournament, just to arrive and show up on site, even if you lose your first round pretty much every match that you win after that, the prize money doubles. And if you win the whole tournament, like the US Open, you're looking at, you know, two or three million to, to, w- to win the entire tournament. So then if you're on the, the periphery there, like if you're number 100 and, and you're yeah. able, you're let, so for simplification purpose, you're, you're number 100 and you're playing in these big tournaments. Yeah. There's a good chance that if the top 100 are in these tournaments, that you're going to lose pretty regularly because you're number 100. 50% of people lose in the first round. Yeah. So can you be like top 100 and be a 500 tennis player and keep uh, your... 
Um, that's, a, that's a good question. No, you, to anyone that is in the top 100 in the world has really earned that position um, because it's, it, it, you know, if you're top 100, you're, you're a legit tennis player. Um, but what I will say is that if you're 100 in the world or 90 in the world, there are many, many instances of them, those type of guys taking out a top five or top 10 player in the world. Okay. It happens all the time. And there's even guys who are 500 in the world that could take out a guy that's 100 in the world. It is the, the, the margins at each level, like they're, they're, you know, just for example, this week in the, in the, in the, in the women's, a girl is in the final. Her name's Emma Raducanu. She's from, she's from England. She's only 18 years of age and she's a qualifier. Now I don't know what her ranking is to prior to the tournament, but if she's a qualifier, she's definitely outside the top 100. So she's probably, let's just say she's 120 or 150 in the world. But she's making the final of the U.S. Open, the biggest tournament in the world. So the, the, the standard of competition is so, so high, even in qualifying, you know, and it just that's one thing I can I, I have to emphasize, like the, the standard of players, the standard of competition is so, so high. So it means that you could be, you know, 200 in the world playing these low level challenger events for, let's just say, three to five hundred dollars per match, even less than that. But you're yet you're playing someone who's capable of being top twenty in the world, you know. So so it, it it is really really competitive, and that's why people nowadays they're always looking for their competitive edge, whether that's with the right coach, whether that's the right training base, whether that's to do with mindset. You know, for me, I would I would listen to podcasts all the time um, prior to tournaments because there's always something that you can learn from a podcast or a conversation. I remember listening to David Goggins. Um, like when I was going to down to the Australian Open, I was listening to him before every, anyone knew of David Goggins. Mm. He, was on a, he was on a podcast with Rich Roll and he had like less than 10,000 people following him on Instagram. Now he's got two or three million. And I was like, this is who I want to be. That's I a cool story. Be, I want to be the toughest guy of all time. And my mindset, like I would say as a tennis player, you know, I was a, I was very physical tennis player and I relied a lot on my physicality. But I was very much wanted to be one of the toughest guys out there. Like you would have to, you know, bleed to beat me. I might not have the biggest strokes or the best serve, but, you know, I, I will never tap out. I will never like give up. I will, I will die to win a match. You know, that was kind of my mindset. And that won me a lot of matches. The only problem with that is that it's not sustainable. And, and, and that's not, you know, I don't, I think there's quality to that, but it's not something that I think that's what makes a great tennis player. There's so many elements to make a great tennis player. I want to like liken that to, as you were talking, I was, you know, thinking how that relates to fighting and how that relates to my fighting. And the reason I was good at fighting, the success I had was because I just went, I just went like someone, like if, if you have one of those, uh, like a doll or something where you pull a thing and they go like, that was it. That yeah. works until it doesn't. That works until I run into a fist or a knee and then it doesn't work anymore. Oh. So that could be why I, you know, got to the level I got and didn't get any further. Maybe, maybe not. But I 100% understand what you're saying, because when you meet someone who's tougher than you, mm, you're not going to win. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's not going to happen that way. Yeah. It's like uh, uh, apes, uh, orangutans and, and chimps and stuff. You know, they, they rule by dominance until... They can't roll by dominance and it doesn't work anymore. So exactly. the answer to this, I think, is a well-rounded approach, maybe having various skills that you can employ at different times, depending. Very much so. And you have to be adaptable. Like the, the game changes. I'm sure it's the same in fighting, but the tennis game has changed a lot over the years. People are, the, the equipment has changed. The stringing of rackets have changed. The way people play, like if you looked at tennis in the 1970s, people were serving volleying. They were always getting to the net on every single ball. Now it's more of a baseline game, but it's actually starting to transition. More and more players are getting to the net again. So things change all the time. And, and I agree with you. You need, you need versatility. You need to be adaptable and, and not just rely on one thing. And, and, and from, from my end, I have to say, I did it because you know, many, there was many weeks and many years where I didn't have a coach or someone in my corner to kind of guide me. So I was just like, well, listen, I'm just going to be trying to be the toughest guy of all time because toughness wins a lot. Toughness wins a lot of tennis matches, but maybe I should have spent more time like getting a bigger serve. That could have got me some more wins. Yeah, but maybe not. Yeah. (laughs) Maybe not. I think about that often. I think, well, maybe if I would have done it, then I'm like, "Mm, maybe not, you know, because there's no guarantee. Maybe I, maybe I just, Maybe the relentless listen and, and go, I yeah. defaulted to because that was what I could do. 
And maybe that was the best outcome. You know, you just don't know. It, it, you know, it, it's really hard to say. As we were talking, as you're talking about, you know, the, the 50th or 500th or whatever beating, you know, playing in this tournament over here for 200 bucks and some of that that person could beat is playing in a, a, a major tournament and for a lot more money in the fine line that exists there. Luck is huge. Uh, you know, even when I was fighting in the UFC, I would think to myself, okay, I'm fighting this guy right now, whoever, Eric Silva or, or Rumble Johnson or whomever I'm fighting. It could very easily be someone that no one's ever heard of before. And then that person could be equally as tough as this person because it just, they just didn't get a shot. You, you've talked a lot about opportunities. You've talked a lot about um, taking advantage of the situation and or not being able to, because you didn't have access to this, that, the other thing. So how big of a role is luck in your career and or tennis? Yeah, I think, I think luck does play, does play a part. I mean, um, what's that famous quote? It's like luck is, is when hard work meets, meets opportunity. And I think I do believe you have to create your own luck through, through your hard work. But for example, I feel I got lucky in 2011 when I had my local tennis club call me up and say, Hey, we we're, we're willing to, to support you for the next, um, few months or the next year or so on the tour. That was a huge amount of luck. Had that not happened, maybe my career would have ended in 2011 or 2012. So I think, I, I think luck has a big part to play also to do with the people that are in your corner. I mean, you know, when you meet someone special, it's like, whoa, I'm really lucky I met this person. Like, you know, for example, when I was 13 years old, my Canadian coach came into my life. You know, that was, I guess that was luck, you know, because had he not come in, I don't know if I would have even pursued tennis. So, um, well, I probably would have pursued tennis, but I don't know if I would have pursued it to the level that I got to. So I do think luck has a, has a, has a large part to play, but uh, you know, you really just have to focus on what's in your control and, and kind of hope and pray that, that, that the universe will provide, you know, I think if you are doing the right things, I think if you are working hard and you're focusing on the right things, I, things, things tend to tend to tend to work out for you that for the most part, that's that, that is my belief. Yeah. And it's, it's, you kind of work backwards. So if I work hard, am I going to get what I want? Mm, I can't promise that, but you can work the other way. If you don't work hard, you're not going to get it. Like there, there's, there's a definite. And, and, and if you find it discouraging to think to yourself, I'm doing all the right things and it's not happening. Understand that if you don't do all the right things, it's not going to happen. Like it, it, that's, that's fact. That's finite. That's black and white. Whereas the other way, it's like, so you're saying there's a chance. Yeah. You're saying there's a chance. <laughs> exactly. I want to touch on something you mentioned earlier, the, the, the angst that came with the, your career and if you yep. miss it, et cetera, I get asked that too. Do you miss fighting? And, and no, I don't miss fighting. I loved it. I love it all. There's aspects of it that I miss, but I also don't miss it. If you, if I could go back to it right now, I wouldn't go back to it. I like what I'm doing now because there's a cost that goes with the stress, the anxiety, the fighting, the risk and et cetera. What do you maybe spell that out a little bit? What do you appreciate now in life that you didn't have when you were playing? Oh, without a shadow of a doubt, because of you know obviously working at the inspiring children foundation and and and, and that it's it's having a, a community of people around me on a consistent basis i mean as an athlete traveling for 10 years 45 weeks a year it's extremely lonely i mean the loneliness that i faced i mean you're literally on your own all the time i mean it, there were times where it was unbearable you know and 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 i really really struggled and I wasn't based in, in Ireland. I was based primarily in Atlanta and I, I did have some good friends there. Um, but for me, that's something that I, the loneliness is something that I don't miss um, because it, it, it was difficult. Now, that's not to say, like, I, I believe we need to be good on our own as well. I, I'm not saying that, you know, because the worst is when you're, you, you need to be with people all the time. I, I'm very happy alone right now, right now, right now alone right now but when i'm when when i was traveling for 45 weeks a year week in week out it was just it was too much and so 
I don't miss that. I do miss the competition. I do miss getting out there and actually competing and giving my best. And there's a great fulfillment in knowing that you gave your best and you, you feel like you're reaching your limit and you're, you're pushing yourself to the highest level. So I definitely, I definitely miss that. Um, but I don't miss the, the, the day-to-day grind. and I don't miss the, how tired I was and how stressed I was. And as athletes, like you're in, you're in a place of chronic stress. And I didn't realize that till I finished. It took me about a year to feel like properly relaxed. And I was like, geez, like I was literally stressed all the time. No wonder I got injured. No wonder I got negative. No wonder I felt anxious because I didn't have coping mechanisms to make me feel good you know if anything my coping mechanism to make me feel good was going out and drinking you know and or not that I drank the whole time but it was was, when you're stressed you tend to do things that you think will take the edge off and the problem with that is is it doesn't work it might work in the short term but it's short term um, short term pleasure long term pain yeah so you have to be that's one thing that I had I changed in my life and that was one of the best decisions of my life to to really clean up my life and start living a better way. Like I feel better because of that. And to, to wrap it up, we're, we're at an hour or there about, so it is a segue of what you just said there, but it also kind of summarizes the inspiring children foundation and the things, the wellness experience, like it, it's kind of all in, in encompassing to provide, you know, for the young people to provide opportunities, right. For, to, to, to do things in life that they wouldn't have had the opportunity to do, but it's also to give them structure and a foundation. And as it correlates to the wellness experience to provide this physical, mental, and emotional health, wealth, um, well-being, what are some of the simple, we don't, we doesn't have to be long, but what are some of the simple things? Cause you seem like a pretty solid individual, right? When I talk to Cheryl, like she's only, I think she's 20, uh, like her composure, I think that's it, composure. Like her composure, like blew me away. It, it was, I'm talking to a 20 year old. I feel like I'm talking to a 40 year old who has been, you know, she has been through a lot. So that that yeah. equates to, to that. But what do you do on a daily, what are some of your habits that, that help you kind of sustain this piece that we're talking about? Without a shadow of a doubt, the, the biggest thing that helps me is meditation. And being willing to take the time to notice the thoughts in my mind and to let them go. I, I think Cheryl's the very first person, I, I'm sure she said it on the podcast when you interviewed her, but this whole concept of that we're not our thoughts is so important. And it's a big thing of what we talk about here in the foundation, because so many times we spend time up in our, he- in our heads and we spend time believing every thought that runs through our mind. And when I'm in that headspace, for me personally, that's what leads to stress. That leads what that's what leads to negativity. That what leads to, you know, comparing myself to others and doing things that don't necessarily make me feel good. So when I take personally take time to meditate and to close my eyes and to breathe, I can at least notice the, all this 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 stuff that is going on in my mind, and I'm and I can let it go. And by letting it go, it's just coming back to your breathing. You notice it, then you let it go. You come back to your breathing. And for me, that's helped me become less stressed. And I know amongst a lot of our youth within the foundation, as well as our staff members, it's something that we practice on a daily basis. So, you know, I meditate every day, three times a day, first thing in the morning, middle of the afternoon, and then right before I go to bed. And I just notice a significant, a significant difference in my mood. I'll tell you a story. Just last week, I missed a few meditations because I, I got to bed late. I woke up late. And um, my mood over the, just over the course of the week, which from the Monday to the Friday complaints uh, uh, changed significantly. And I noticed myself complaining a little bit more. I noticed myself being negative. And by taking the time, obviously you got to have sl- the correct sleep patterns. Like if you're not sleeping well, you know, that's really challenging. And I'm, I know, I'm sure for many people who have young kids, that's a, it's a really difficult situation. My, my sister has two young kids, a two-year-old and a four-year-old. And those years are, are really difficult because when you, you're not getting the right sleep, you're more cranky, you're more, you know, you're, you're more irritated. And um, at least on my end, the meditation is key is along with mindfulness exercises. And then the biggest thing is getting out into nature. And, and here in Las Vegas, I mean, we've got beautiful mountains. We've got the Red Rock Canyon nearby. We've got beautiful rivers and lakes and things like that. And that for me helps my mental health that that's what helps me stay in a good solid headspace as along with kind of talking to friends and expressing myself i think as men that's something that is very difficult for men is to express themselves and to share what's going on in their lives and 
And we have a men's group here in Las Vegas as well. Myself, the executive director, Trent, along with some other men. And we literally just keep it real. And we talk about what's going on in our lives and our struggles. And for whatever reason, for amongst men, it's, it's really difficult to share, to share what's really going on in, underneath. And when you have a group of people, when you have someone you can express yourself to, it is very healing. It is very, uh, very helpful. I recently read in a book, a pain shared is a pain divided. And whether you're talking about, it, it, it's, a, it's a, a really good quote, a really good practice as well. Uh, to clarify, in case anyone's wondering, how long are those meditative sessions that you talked about? Uh, you know, it could be anything from two minutes in the morning to 20 minutes. It really depends on, on what's right for you. I would recommend for anyone that, that is just getting into it or curious about it, you can start off with a 10 second meditation. And if you look behind me, actually, you're going to see this door here that our, our youth in the foundation, they, they uh, painted and you'll see the numbers one to 10. And then up here, you'll see like a tree and a brain and someone sitting down. And it's actually, this is our meditation room that I'm in right now. Okay. Um, our, our, our kids, our kids built this meditation room and a good exercise, a, a one to 10 kind of breathing exercise is you close your eyes and for every inhale, you count one for every exhale, it's two, inhale, three, you, you work your way up to 10. Then when you get to 10, you work your way back down to zero. And you'll notice as you do this exercise, you might, your mind will start running or your mind will start thinking about what's for breakfast or what's next or whatever. And it's the, the practice is your ability to notice your thoughts and then just to bring it back to your breathing or to bring it back to the number that you're on. And I found it to be very helpful and, and very beneficial. And is that the, the breathing in the one, does that mean your inhale is one second or however long your inhale is, you're just counting to one? Yeah, so it's inhale like, so it's inhale one, exhale two, inhale, exhale four. So you're inhaling for three seconds, exhaling for four exactly. seconds. Okay, yeah. yeah. And there, uh, I, no, no, ahead. you're not, sorry, you're not exhaling for four seconds. It's just for every inhale, breath it's one for every exhale it's two it's oh, not, okay yeah it's you're just gonna pay attention to your breathing and notice notice your breathing but just count each each breath okay i got it uh and i want to add to this as we wrap up so i i don't know when i'm going to air this episode i probably will have covered the book the align method which talks about breathing uh there's a guy named brian mckenzie if anyone wants to um and dr andy galpin they wrote a book called unplugged and then the book Breath, and then also Wim Hof, like all of these sources, if you're like, hmm, I have been hearing that a lot, I've been hearing about breath a lot, I don't really understand what they're talking about. Look, the, the Align Method, Wim Hof, the book Breath, um, uh, what uh, James is talking about here, it, it's, it's worth diving into, um, and it's worth learning about and really focusing on. I do it a lot ever since I, I started giving, like, hmm, maybe I'll give that a try. And it really does help. So it's awesome. This has been really, really fun. And I was going to compliment the uh, the woodwork and the background and the artwork. And that makes sense that you said it's the meditation room because it's really cool. And I do put these I do put these interviews on YouTube if anyone wants to watch them in YouTube slash Charlie mm -hmm. Spaniard. But uh, it's really cool. And I was going to ask them about that off air. So I'm glad you brought that up. Thanks, Charlie. It's great. Um, it's great doing this podcast with you. I appreciate you asking me on i'm really delighted we, we've connected and uh, i appreciate what you're doing and and uh your questions and how you know this is going to help a lot of people like what you're doing and, and sharing your story so thank you so much it's it's been awesome kind of getting to know you likewise man so the the inspiring is it inspiring children foundation.org so it's inspiring children.org that's okay. that's our website our instagram is at inspiring children and uh, that's where you can follow us and see kind of what we're up to. And then do you have any public profiles you want to throw out? Uh, my Instagram is at jamesmcgee01. And I'm pretty much on all my social media. It's at jamesmcgee01. And I have a website. Pardon me? That's M-C-G-E-E-01. -E 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 yeah, M-C-G-E-E-01. -E -E and that's, uh, that's where I actually share some of my work with the foundation on my, on my social media um, channels. Well, you've got a new following me, man. I, uh, I appreciate this. So I met, yeah, I met I, a lot of really cool people at this event that at the wellness experience. So it, it it's, I don't know, it, it, 
that was a really cool event. But also I, I feel like all these people I meet, I want to be best friends with. So I, I do <laughs> hope we continue to be buddies. You have my info, I have your info, but for sure. really appreciate you being here, man. Thank you so much, Charlie. You're always welcome uh, to Las Vegas. Whenever you come in here, we'll, we'll show you around and, and uh, show, show you what we're all about here. Awesome. Thanks, buddy. All right. Take care of yourself.